foundations for many homes. And so when the settlement freeze was announced, with the key word being new homes, all the foundations had already been laid for thousands of homes, which didn't any longer constitute new construction. So on the ground, there was actually no settlement freeze at all as uh, the main monitoring organization, Peace Now, pointed out in several uh, press releases. As to what can be done now, I don't think there are any uh, magic formulas. There have been basically three strategies for trying to counter uh, Israel's annexation of the West Bank in Gaza. Uh, one of the strategies you mentioned is the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. A second strategy has been the various forms of nonviolent resistance, including in the villages where the Israeli wall is annexing Palestinian land and also undertaking <coughs> like the Mavi Marmara flotilla and the flotilla right now of uh, Jewish activists that's heading towards Gaza. And the third tactic has been the try to use the use of international law to put pressure on Israel. So as we meet, as we speak now at this very moment, the Human Rights Council is meeting to consider two reports one on what happened in the Mavi Marmara, and the second on the follow-up to the Goldstone Report. And it seems to me, at any rate, that each of these strategies has had you know, a record, a mixed record, some successes, some failures. Uh, and the challenge now is to refine these strategies, to make them even more effective than they've been so far. Right. You, uh, next question. <laughs> Hello? Hi, Norby, can you hear me? Hello? But I just wanted to uh, ask you uh, ways in, in, in constructively helping Palestinians protest in such a way that um, doesn't reinforce the violence uh, that they're that they're experiencing right now. Uh, obviously, uh, you know the armed the armed aid from Iran and, and other uh, Arab countries in that area is is not helping the Palestinian cause, and it's in some ways making it worse. Um, just, just wanted to just hear your comments on, on why you're, you support Hamas and, and uh, you know, helping Palestinians in the protest in, in more constructive ways. Well, I think you made a number of statements which are problematic, uh, so I should clarify my own view. First of all, I have no knowledge whatsoever of what kinds of arms Iran or any other state has been sending secretly or not so secretly to places like the Gaza Strip. What I can say with a certain amount of certainty is that prior to the Israeli massacre in Gaza between December 27th 2008 and January, two, uh, January 18, 2009, there were many claims made about this massive arsenal that Hamas had accumulated due to Iranian arms shipments. But once the Israeli invasion began, and as the Israeli invasion unfolded, there was no evidence whatsoever that how 
Hamas had any significant arm to resist the Israelis. If you look at, for example, the casualties, in the course of the 22 days, three Israeli civilians were killed. And according to Amnesty International, all of one house, that's one house, all of one house was almost destroyed by the um, Hamas rocket and mortar attacks. There are also a couple of other, there are a few other civilian structures in Israel which were damaged. Well, if you look, uh, leaving aside the issues of morality and legality of what Hamas did, and look strictly at the military side, judging from the military side, it doesn't seem that Hamas had accumulated very many weapons, even though prior to the attack, there was a mass uh, propaganda claim by Israel about all of these rockets and missiles that Iran had secretly sent to Hamas. So I'm not prepared to join your certainty about Hamas, is Iran having supplied or continuing to supply Hamas with weapons. I have no basis to judge that claim. As to the second point you made, I don't support Hamas any more than I support any other movement around the world. Uh, these are questions that have to be decided by the people who are uh, wanting to be represented. The fact of the matter is that in the last free and fair elections held among the Palestinians in the occupied territories, Hamas did emerge as a victor, and before it had any opportunity to prove itself as an elected government, the United States, Israel, and the EU, EU imposed brutal sanctions on the people of Gaza to punish them for the government they elected. And then in July or June 2000, Seven, the U.S. and Israel tried to overthrow the Hamas government when they elected government, and when they were unsuccessful, they were then um, in, uh, uh, the blockade of Gaza was tightened again, and Amnesty International called it a flagrant violation of international law. So I don't think the issue is who do I support, let alone who you support. The issue is whether Palestinians should have the right to elect the representatives of their choosing. Um, next question. Okay, so if you have questions, it's better. Uh, if you have questions, just come here. Closer. And, yeah. and I'm having trouble hearing you again. Now I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, how about a general question? What is the relationship between the uh, uh, Israeli Palestinian conflict and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, if there's any relationship? And what is the what is what the United States wants to achieve in the region and why? And and in a even broader sense, why is the American government uh, seem to be so an aggressive foreign policy against so many countries? What would be your explanation for, for the United States showing these uh, foreign policies of aggressiveness and uh, putting uh, puppet governments in so many countries? If you could explain us in a broader sense, if you have any enlightenment on, on this. Thank you. Those are, very, those are very large subjects. It would, it would, in effect, be asking me to explain U.S. foreign policy over a long period of time. And if I were to do that, I'm afraid in my short period of time, I would end up just giving you cliches and slogans.
Soviet rather than a serious analysis. What I do think I can say is that obviously there is a connection uh, or some connection, it's not always perfectly clear. There is a connection between the U.S. involvement in Iraq, in Afghanistan, the uh, threats against Iran, and the um, <clears throat> U.S. backing for Israeli policy in the occupied territories. Uh, it's no coincidence, I think, that so much of U.S. military power is now concentrated in that corner of the world, and it will certainly come as no shock to anyone listening now that there must be some relationship between this concentration of U.S. military power and the strategic, uh, <coughs> the strategic value of the region. But having said that, as a big picture, when you start looking at the details, it's not altogether clear how close the relationship between each of these aggressive actions is. So for example, in the case of Iraq, in my opinion, the U.S. basically attacked Iraq because they had an opportunity to use its military power and demonstrate to the world that it's still the dominant superpower. After the 9-11 uh, attack, and it just looked around for an opportunity, and it knew that Iraq would be quite easy to prevail over at least the initial his military attack would be quite easy. And so it chose Iraq. I'm not convinced it had much to do with the oil. I think it had a lot more to do with the fact that it was an easy target to demonstrate U.S. power. In the case of Afghanistan, it's basically a political war. That is to say, Obama, when he ran for office, had to prove that he was a worthy murderer. Otherwise, he couldn't have achieved high office. Being a worthy murderer in the United States is called being presidential. And so he needed a war. And of course, the Iraq war was very unpopular at that point. And so he chose Afghanistan in order to prove that he was capable of being a murderer on a grand scale. And now he's caught in a bind because he's caught in a difficult situation because he can't leave Afghanistan without, without being accused of being weak. And that will enable his adversaries to defeat him at election time. On the other hand, he can't win the war in Afghanistan, and I'm certain he's bright enough to know that. And so he's basically just, at this point, killing Afghanis in order to get reelected, not because he thinks there's any strategic interest in Afghanistan. It's in the most narrow sense, it's a political war.